Good evening. I'm Max Rudin, president and publisher of Library of America, and welcome to LOA Live. For those who don't know, Library of America is a nonprofit organization dedicated to publishing authoritative new volumes of great American writers and to keeping the many voiced American literary tradition a vital part of our culture. We're grateful to our partners this evening, the Association of Literary Scholars, Critics, and Writers, the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard, and the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, home to the James Baldwin Papers. A special welcome to Library of America fellows and members who support our mission. James Baldwin's writing, The Power of His Mind and Voice, is once again at the center of meaningful conversation about our democracy. This evening's event continues Reading James Baldwin Now, a series of engagements with Baldwin's work led by gifted scholars, writers, and teachers. Our focus tonight is the 1974 novel, If Beale Street Could Talk, found in Library of America series, volume number 272, Baldwin's Later Novels, edited by Daryl Pinckney, one of three LOA volumes collecting Baldwin's essays and fiction. We're fortunate to have as our guest this evening, Gabrielle Bellow, staff writer at LitHub and contributing editor at Catapult. Her essays have appeared in the New Yorker, the New York Times, the Atlantic, the Guardian, Guardian, Slate, and many other places, and widely anthologized, most recently in Indelible in the Hippocampus, writings from the Me Too movement. Uh, Gabby and I will chat for about 25 minutes or half hour and then invite your questions. You can submit a question or comment at any time using the Q&A button on your menu bar. Please let us know where you're viewing from. And now please welcome Gabrielle Below. Hi Gabby, welcome uh, and thank you again uh, for coming tonight. Of course. So, uh, let's start off at the beginning. So it's 1974. Uh, Baldwin is writing and publishing If Beale Street Could Talk. Um, you know, where are we in Baldwin's life and career at this point? Sure. Well, I want to start just by uh, once again thanking everybody for being here tonight. I know there are lots of places virtually that we could all be. And I'm so happy that you're here with us to talk about Baldwin because, you know, arguably who more important to talk about than Baldwin right now, you know, you know, but when we talk about if Beale Street could talk, you know, sort of placing this within Baldwin's career, I think there are a few interesting ways that we can sort of begin to understand the, the place of this curious novel. So Baldwin famously described this book as a strange novel, right, to his brother David. And for a long time, critics have, you know, arguably agreed that this is a strange novel, a, a book that doesn't entirely fit within Baldwin's uh, collection of fiction and, and, and nonfiction, uh, because it, it's a little bit different from anything else that he composed before. It's one of his late novels. Uh, it was published in the 1970s. Uh, and, and Baldwin's late works are often considered the works that he did uh, towards the end of his life, which in this case would be the 1970s and the 1980s, you know, culminating, of course, in his death in 1987. So a lot of the attention that has been given to Baldwin's work has been for his earlier uh, writing. So this is, you know, stuff like Go Tell It on the Mountain, 1953, uh, his first novel, or Giovanni's Room, his second novel, uh, uh, Notes of a Native Son, his first essay collection. Uh, these earlier works tend to be what Baldwin scholars talk about uh, the most. And, and this has been the case for a very long time. Later works, like If Beale Street Could Talk, have been neglected for a very long time. 
ironically, though, because of Barry Jenkins uh, cinematic adaptation, which I will have a lot to say about uh, later, uh, and please excuse the train in my background. Uh, you know, ironically, because of this movie, uh, many people who have not actually read Baldwin before might actually know if Beale Street, if Beale Street could talk uh, by name, uh, you know, even more so than his other works. So it's, it's experienced a surge in popularity thanks to uh, the adaptation, but it's also become a work that scholars are studying more and more, uh, you know, in, in, within the last decade. So it's experienced a resurgence in interest. So I often like to make the argument that I think it's actually Baldwin's masterpiece. Uh, you know, this work that for so long has been ne neglected, a work that when it was first uh, published was very critically divisive, a work that uh, some critics argued was a beautiful love story and that other critics argued was, you know, outdated, a work that was politically from another era, a work that was, you know, either too political or not political enough, depending on which critic you, you asked. And so by and large, if Beale Street Could Talk has not really for a long time been given the critical due that I think it deserves. It's a very complicated, beautiful, multi-layered novel. And to really unpack what Baldwin is doing, we have to go through, you know, the various strands uh, within this novel, the many stories that Baldwin is trying to tell us. So if Beale Street Could Talk uh, was one of Baldwin's final novels, and I think it's his most accessible, uh, you know, it's the easiest to get into, I think, if you're a first time Baldwin reader. But I think it's also very worth looking into if you've read every, everything else by Baldwin except for this. And for many scholars, again, that has been the case for a long time. So, yeah, it, it's a work that has been talked about, you know, not enough in the past, but thankfully, you know, through events like this and through the movie, it's finally getting a little bit of the recognition that I think it deserves. Thanks, that's a perfect setup. Um, I mean, it's interesting you should mention that comment about Baldwin to his brother that it's strange. It's his strangest novel. And, and maybe it's for some of the reasons that you just said, which is that, you know, it's a love story, but it's also, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's a protest against, it has outrage against social injustice. It's a family, uh, you know, drama, and yet it also has this thing about the carceral state in it. And I, I want to get into that and unpack that a little bit. So why don't, you know, maybe we could talk about those things, first one and then the other. And um, maybe to, to, to set us up for the, the love story part, um, maybe we just could just listen to some of Baldwin's words. Here's a brief passage in which some of these themes, some of the love story themes kind of come together. Uh, this scene takes place in the Rivers family home in Harlem, uh, uh, relatively early in the book. And the person who's speaking, and we'll talk about this in a second, is the narrator, Tish, who's a 19 year old girl who's pregnant, as you'll soon hear. I sat on the hassock leaning on daddy's knee. Now it was seven o'clock and the streets were full of noises. I felt very quiet after my long day and my baby began to be real to me. I don't mean that it hadn't been real before, but now in a way I was alone with it. Sis had left the lights very low. She put on a Ray Charles record and sat down on the sofa. I listened to the music and the sounds from the streets and daddy's hand rested lightly on my hair and everything seemed connected, the street sounds and Ray's voice and his piano and my daddy's hand and my sister's silhouette and the sounds and the lights coming from the kitchen. It was as though we were a picture trapped in time. This had been happening for hundreds of years, people sitting in a room waiting for dinner and listening to the blues. And it was as though out of these elements, this patience, my daddy's touch, the sounds of my mother in the kitchen, the way the light fell, the way the music continued beneath everything. 
the movement of Ernestine's head as she lit a cigarette, the movement of her hand as she dropped the match into the ashtray, the blurred human voices rising from the street out of this rage and a steady, somehow triumphant sorrow. My baby was slowly being formed. I wondered if it would have Fanny's eyes as someone had wondered not after all so very long ago about the eyes of Joseph, my father, whose hand rested on my head. What struck me suddenly more than anything else was something I knew but hadn't looked at. This was Fanny's baby and mine. We had made it together. It was both of us. I didn't know either of us very well. What would both of us be like? But this somehow made me think of Fanny and made me smile. My father rubbed his hand over my forehead. I thought of Fanny's touch, of Fanny in my arms, his breath, his touch, his odor, his weight, that terrible and beautiful presence riding into me and his breath being snarled as if by a golden thread deeper and deeper in his throat as he rode, as he rode deeper and deeper, not so much into me as into a kingdom which lay just beyond, behind his eyes. He worked on wood that way. He worked on stone that way. If I had never seen him work, I might never have known he loved me. It's a miracle to realize that somebody loves you. So what strikes you about that passage? So it's hard to know where to begin, right? I mean, you know, on a sort of writerly level, you know, notice the extraordinary sensual details that Baldwin piles on. The way that Baldwin really brings this narrator's interiority, you know, her thoughts and feelings to life. But also notice the way that Baldwin is attempting to inhabit the mind of this 19 year old girl, right? Who at this point in the novel is pregnant but is not just, you know, pregnant. She's wondering what that means. You know, she's never done this before. So there is a lot of tenderness in that passage, right? There, there, there is a lot of really trying to inhabit a space and a body that, you know, was not Baldwin's own, but that wasn't all necessarily that dissimilar to Baldwin's upbringing in some ways either. And we, we can definitely talk more about Baldwin's upbringing uh, in a bit. But this is a great jumping off point to sort of talk about, you know, what this novel really is about. And one of the reasons that Baldwin considered it so strange. So in this passage, you see uh, the main character whose name is Tish, thinking about the baby that she's going to have with Fani, uh, whose real name is Alonzo, but everyone calls him Fani. When the novel begins, Fani is in prison. Fani is a person we only get to see behind glass when, that, when the novel opens, because Tish has gone to see him. At this point, when the book begins, we have no idea why Fani is in prison, and more importantly, no sense that he's going to leave. And this is intentional. Baldwin wants you to know from the very beginning that the carceral state, American prisons, are going to be a major part of this novel, but that is also going to be a novel that takes place uh, sort of to the degree that it's possible to tell a love story between, you know, somebody who's in prison and somebody who's outside. So what follows from here is sort of what led up to Fawny being imprisoned. And we jump back and forth between past and present. There's a lot of beautiful moving through time and space, but really the prison is the place we always sort of circle back to because Fanny has been arrested for a crime that there is no evidence he actually committed. A narrative that for Baldwin and for many other writers of color 
is not that unfamiliar. It's just what we've come to expect. So Fani, uh, you know, is put into prison for supposedly having assaulted a Puerto Rican woman, which we learn much later in the novel. What's interesting here is that the woman in question claims that a black man assaulted her. But when the police lineup is given, Fani is the only black man in the lineup. Who do you think she was gonna choose if he's the only person in the lineup? It's a really interesting choice on Baldwin's part, uh, which may have some uh, historical connections to uh, you know, similar cases that Baldwin saw. But I like to think that Baldwin, Baldwin is trying to tell us a story that too many of us know intimately, that the criminal justice system is stacked against you if you look a certain way and if you live in this country. So Fani goes to prison uh, and he is arrested, by the way, by a police officer who really has it out for him from the moment that he, you know, lays eyes on Fani. Uh, this is Officer Bell, uh, a white cop who first encounters Fani uh, outside of an Italian uh, market where Tish uh, has been trying to fend off a very gross uh, white, white guy who's been trying to hit on her with very poor uh, lines. And he actually grabs her. Uh, this 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 white guy, and Fani sees, and and immediately begins uh, fighting off this this white guy, right? Who who's trying to uh, harass and 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 grope uh, tr uh, Tish. So the cop sees this and immediately assumes that Fani is the blame is to blame, and immediately he tries to arrest him. So Tish uh, tries to tell him, you know, th this isn't Fani's fault. Uh, Fani didn't do this. But the officer doesn't listen until an Italian woman who runs the market speaks up herself and says, actually, no, Fani's innocent. The, the person who did this is well known as a sort of sexual harasser, this, this white guy who, who did this. Even then, Officer Bell doesn't want to, you know, let go. And so this is a theme that keeps circling back. Yeah. I, I actually want to get in, get into that and actually sure. look at that path in a sec. If, I wonder if before we could get there, we could, we could I wanted to go back to something you said before, um, you know, the, the theme of, of love uh, from the passage we just read, you know, love is, is, is a, is a theme throughout Baldwin's work, um, you know, to say something obvious. Um, but the treatment of love here in 1974 seems different from the theme of love as it appears in, you know, the, the work that people know best of Baldwin's from the 50s and, and mainly, and the 60s especially. Uh, there seems to be a very different, well, I shouldn't, I don't wanna put words in your mouth. To, I mean, to me, there seems to be a different inflection on, on the idea of love here. And I wonder if you could just reflect on that for a second. Sure, sure. So if, if Bill Street Could Talk is really interesting uh, for that reason that, you know, aside from the stuff I was talking about before with, you know, uh, a black man being in prison for a crime he did not commit and all of this, you know, aside from that, it's also a very tender love story, right? And it's specifically a Black love story. This is a story where uh, Black Americans get to freely show love. There, there is no censoring of tenderness in, in this book, right? And you see a little bit of that in the passage that, that you read, Max, um, and in many others, you know, when Tish and Fani, uh, before Fani is arrested, 
uh, get to be together. So in Baldwin's work uh, before this, you know, th there is definitely, you know, allusions to uh, all kinds of love. Uh, most famously in Giovanni's room, for instance, uh, you know, which was written from the perspective, interestingly, of a white European, or sorry, a white American uh, in Europe, uh, you know, there Baldwin explores queer relationships, right? What's interesting in Giovanni's room, though, is that this is a book where the narrator, uh, David, is unable to get over his own sense of self-loathing. He's a queer character who's deeply in the closet and he hates himself for that. He, he, he doesn't know who he is or what to do with that. Baldwin himself was also queer and for many years, you know, Baldwin attempted to write about this in various ways. But in Giovanni's room, you know, even though there, there is a love story in there. It's a love story that is tempered by self-loathing. Uh, it's a love story that is tempered by, you know, an inability to fully commit to another person, right? If Beale Street Could Talk is very different because Tish and Fani are so clearly in love with each other. There is no question. And Baldwin captures this really beautifully, right? So this is a novel where characters in love get to actually be in love. And Baldwin doesn't shy away from, you know, all of the sort of minor and major details that capture that. So small things like Fanny grabbing Tish's hand and saying hello you know, which is the kind of thing a, a couple might do when you know each other very well. Uh, the way that they touch each other, the way that they make small talk with each other, then the sort of nicknames that they have for each other. Um, it, it's a book that is sort of unabashedly romantic. Yeah. So even though there is much more going on, um, if Beale Street Could Talk is unquestionably a love story sort of at core, right? And I'm sorry, Max, I didn't mean to, to cut no, you off no, there. I, I, no, I was, no, that's very good what you said. And um, you know, I was thinking that in the essays of the 60s, love has also come a force that is going, to, that Baldwin sees as kind of a utopian force that's going to kind of, you know, address some of America's, you know, racial issues. And it seems like here, it, it's not, I mean, as you say, this is this is a, a black love story, and it's quite it's quite a different perspective. Um, I just wanted to pull a couple threads out from uh, to ask you about also before we go to the other the other large subject in in the book. Um, you know, this is Baldwin's only novel told from a female uh, point of view, um, and I'm curious and you know what you think about that. I mean, and maybe there's not a lot to say about it that you haven't already said, but I mean, do, do you, did it give Baldwin access to certain things or what, I guess the question is, what did have, what, it, what's about, what's that choice all about? Like what, sure. you know, he makes a choice to tell a story through the eyes of a 19 year old girl. You know, why, you know, what, what was that? What did that allow him to do that he couldn't do in another kind of formal setting? Do you think? Sure. So I want to start by actually, uh, you know, comparing this again to Giovanni's Room, right, which is also written from a perspective uh, that is different from Baldwin's. So in Giovanni's Room, which is, again, Baldwin's second novel, the narrator is a white American. Uh, and Baldwin famously said that the reason he chose to have a white American as the narrator, as opposed to uh, a, a black American, was that he wanted Giovanni's room to sort of focus on uh, on queerness and sort of the questions of what it might mean to have a queer relationship uh, as an expat in Europe. 
And he felt that he couldn't, at the time anyway, combine uh, what he called the quote unquote racial question and the quote unquote uh, sexual question. That, 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 that was how he referred to you uh, talking about race and talking about uh, gender and sexual orientation. So Baldwin sort of felt at the time that he had to uh, write from a different perspective to tackle uh, something specific. When, when it comes to if Beale Street could talk, I think something different is going on. So this is a much later Baldwin, as we talked about earlier. And what Baldwin is doing here is inhabiting a perspective that is, is, is not his, of course, but that is very much adjacent to uh, some of his experiences as uh, a young gay Black man uh, in Harlem when he was growing up, uh, before he left for Europe uh, in 1948. And, and, al and also, of course, uh, he's trying to see what he can uncover about uh, gender by inhabiting a female perspective. So one of the interesting things about if Beale Street could talk from a, from a gender perspective is the number of times that Baldwin talks about maleness, what it means to be uh, male or sort of masculine of center uh, from Tish's perspective. And so in some ways inhabiting Tish's uh, point of view allows Baldwin to critique uh, masculinity in, in some ways. You know, there are a number of comments about what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, uh, and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And we can certainly argue, you know, about whether or not Baldwin inhabits uh, a, a female perspective uh, in, entirely perfectly. I mean, I, I think there's certainly a wide uh, discussion to be had there. But I think it lets Baldwin access, you know, a sort of critique of himself in some ways, a, a critique of uh, what it means to be a male, uh, a critique of, uh, in some ways, what we would call toxic masculinity today. Um, it, it also makes me think, as a sort of final point here, of Baldwin's uh, famous talk with Audre Lorde, uh, where Lord famously took him to task a little bit for not fully being willing to, in, in her mind, uh, acknowledge his maleness when he talked about uh, what America needed to do uh, to sort of attempt to overcome uh, the racial hurdles that, that existed at the time that they were speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, so Lord felt that Baldwin didn't always acknowledge these special struggles that you go through as a Black woman. And Baldwin eventually came around to this, sort of acknowledging that there were things he might not have been uh, entirely aware of when he was, uh, you know, talking about what needed to be done. And so if Beale Street could, could talk feels to me sort of like a response to uh, that kind of discourse, right? Baldwin's attempt to see himself through uh, another's eyes, if that, if that makes sense. And that's really interesting. I mean, there are, there are many other strands in that passage I would love to talk to you about. I mean, one is the idea of the, the bait. I mean, the book is structured as the birth of a baby. And that's that's basically the plot. <laughs> you know, it's done. And you know, two years before in No Name in the Street, uh, the book starts with Baldwin talking about babies as miracles and you know, fragile miracles. And that's clearly a theme here too. The idea, I mean, the two sides of the story are the beautiful birth of this miraculous thing and the world into which this miraculous thing is is being placed and has to make its ter its way, and I mean that you know then and, and that's one way to describe what the book is, and No Name in the Street is that too. I, and I they're both struggling against form in interesting ways. But I mean there's there's that there's the question of parenthood, 
I mean, this is a book where, you know, one woman says to another in a climactic scene, you know, I'm a mother too. And being a mother and being a parent and the terrible responsibility of bringing these creatures into this world, you know, is also a theme. But we, you know, we don't have enough time. And I, I, I do want to get. And I mean, you're welcome to comment on any of that. I also want to talk about the music in the scene, and I, we will talk about that in a, in a bit. But I think we should talk about this other big theme, obviously, which is prison and the carceral state, and and how and the role that that plays in, in the book. I mean, um, you know, I, I was going to read the passage uh, where, that you describe that takes place in the grocery store out, you know, in Bleecker Street, which is a brutal passage about a racist cop who um, uh, gets embarrassed because he can't arrest the man he wants to arrest and decides to take his revenge, which he does by basically framing uh, Fani for a crime he, he didn't commit and putting him into the system from which he then can't, it has difficulty escaping. Maybe he escapes, maybe he doesn't. It's, it's not entirely clear. Um, but, you know, I, I guess I won't read it because we don't, we don't um, I won't take the time to read it. But what I do want to say is that, you know, one of the reasons for the mixed reviews had to do with the, the politics of the book, uh, as you were saying earlier, and this, this sense that somehow this rage against the carceral system was a whole, was a throwback to the 1960s and that, that Baldwin somehow had never let it go. And, and you know, it was time to move on. And and uh, this is 1974 for cripes sakes, you know, we don't talk about that kind of stuff anymore. And, um, you know, I, I think that that's interesting. I just wanted to quote one thing that, that Daryl Pinckney, you know, said about this period in Baldwin and, and, and Beale Street in particular, he said, you know, there's this feeling that Baldwin's late fiction is somehow unsuccessfully political, uh, even though the works aren't political in any conventional sense at all. And then reflecting on the period, he says, the feeling was that we had heard it before. As far back as the summer of 68, mere months after Martin Luther King's assassination, Norman Mailer said he was tired of black people, quote, and their rights, end quote. It was as though many whites in his audience said they had had enough of hearing about problems they no longer had the will to solve. They preferred fantasies of resolution, of roots bound, the past appeased. Um, so, you know, Pinkney obviously was talking about the shift in African-American literature in the 70s and, um, so I wanted to, and then we have a question about that too, that, that, that Baldwin was accused of bitterness, uh, somehow being stuck uh, in the past or something and, and being bitter. And the question from the audience is, you know, do you think Beale Street is bitter? And I guess the other question is about this theme in the book is from our current perspective, <laughs> you know, from the perspective of the last year, uh, let's say, uh, although we could, you know, with Baldwin, stuck in the past or was he actually more forward looking than anybody knew at the time? If that's the right way to frame the question. Uh, sure, so I will respond first to the, the uh, audience question. Uh, uh, thank you for, for asking uh, about, you know, whether or not this book might be considered bitter, which I think is a very interesting term to use. Uh, potentially loaded term as well, right? Um, and I think that the answer is complicated, that for the most part, I take this as a very tender book, you know, that, that that's a word I've used a number of times tonight, and it's because it feels so true to the tone of the book, that there is a lot of love like very deeply embedded into the core uh, of this book. But if you read the book carefully, you will see a number of, you know, very volcanic, really, condemnations of uh, America as a country, you know, as a whole. Uh, many times, you know, Tish sort of taking on a voice that sounds more like Baldwin's than her own who will say that America is the kind of country that nobody should be unfortunate enough to have been born in, that America is a country that should never have been, quote unquote, discovered. Uh, uh, and she, you know, reflects in a, in a tone that I think could be termed bitter, you know, on what it means to live in such an unfair unjust country, 
And I think that's a justified bitterness, you know? It's not a bitterness for the sake thereof. It's a bitterness that Tish and, and Baldwin have learned, right? That this is simply a reaction to you living in a country that is profoundly not equal, profoundly not going to give people a, a fair shot. So if it feels bitter in those moments, I think it's supposed to, right? And, and so sort of going from there into the question of the politics of the book, right? You know, this is one of the works of Baldwin that tends to be read, you know, less politically than his earlier work. And to some degree that makes sense because, you know, Go Tell It on the Mountain is, you know, very much a book that deals explicitly with uh, the, the, the politics of uh, Blackness in Harlem, Blackness uh, and the, the church that, that Baldwin uh, grew up in, uh, slavery, uh, whether or not the North was actually less racist, as was widely believed, than the South. And Baldwin's answer, by the way, is always no, that the, the North, uh, places like New York, are never actually less racist uh, for the characters who actually live there. So uh, a work like Beale Street, you know, that is a love story sort of at core, might not seem as overtly political as those, or those earlier works. But I think the very fact that Baldwin centers Black love is itself a political gesture. Mm -hmm. That Baldwin is making the point that this deserves to be seen and heard and understood at the same level as the countless depictions thereof in you know, white-centered books uh, of the era and before. In other words, there is something radical about depicting Black love so freely, so sensually on the page. And this, by the way, uh, is why I think, you know, regardless of what anyone else might think about uh, whether or not Barry Jenkins' adaptation captures Baldwin's book, uh, the, the one thing I can say that that movie definitely does do is capture, you know, the radicalness of that sensuality on screen, right? So the Black love itself, to me, becomes political just by virtue of its unabashed, unapologetic existence. But it's also very clearly a critique of the American uh, prison system and the, and the American justice system. You know, Baldwin talks explicitly about the things that people in prison suffer, particularly Black men. He talks about uh, rape very graphically a number of times. Uh, Fani's best friend uh, admits that he not only saw somebody being raped, but that he himself was also uh, similarly assaulted. Fani is constantly at risk in his mind of a similar fate. And Fani is also beaten up when he tries to resist. Daniel, you know, Fani's best friend, is one of the few witnesses who could uh, provide an alibi for Fani. Uh, but Daniel is arrested for no clear reason. Uh, and is sent upstate where it's harder to get a hold of him as a witness. And there's also talk that he's being, excuse me, drugged in prison. So all of this is sort of a way to keep Fani and by extension to keep, you know, black men like him who have been unjustly accused uh, in the sort of depths of, of the prison system, right? So, I simply don't agree that this is not a political novel uh, in the same way that, that Baldwin's previous novels were. 
uh, or more accurately, it, it is different in the way it presents its politics, but I don't think it's, it's any less political, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes total sense. And I mean, uh, that's, and it's very well said. I mean, what I find fascinating about, I mean, you know, we, the reason I keep alluding to No Name in the Street is because we had a session like this about that book. And that was written two years before this one. And it was also not received so well at the time. And it had, had for similar reasons, that is to say, it had formal, it was formally confusing. <laughs> and what's interesting to me is the way Baldwin is trying, is struggling against form in both these books uh, expressively. I mean, in that, I'm sorry, I don't mean to, I, I don't want to, but in, in that book, there's this recursive form, which has this feeling of returning to trauma, you know, being traumatized and returning to the same um, traumatic moments again and again. Here, it's it's trying to do, as you're saying, two kinds of political gestures. One, a political gesture of protest about a system or description, and another one, a political gesture of centering Black love. And how do you do both those things in the same book? And I think that, you know, one of the interesting things, or one, I think one of the ways to understand that is through Baldwin's allusions to music. And I, I wanted to just talk about that for a moment. Um, because maybe that's a way of also thinking about how these elements all hold together, or maybe it's not, but, uh, so the, the title, If Beale Street Could Talk, alludes, is a line from a famous blues, um, the Beale Street Blues, and, um, it's the only one of Baldwin's novel titles which has a blues, which alludes to a blues. The other two book, books that have music titles, Go Tell on the Mountain Just Above My Head, are spirituals. Uh, which is, you know, slightly different, although it's, you know, um, so I, I guess I wanted to ask, and one of the questions was, you know, well, how come Beale Street, it's Memphis, like, what's it got to do with this story, which is Harlem, like, why, you know, why is Baldwin doing that? And I think it's a really good question, you know, so what, I want to just hear you, talk, you know, your own reflections on why does he choose a line from Beale Street Blues, do you think, as the title for this and I'm, I have more questions I want to ask you about music in the book too, but but let's just start there. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I mean, this is a very musical book, right? I mean, there are a number of references to uh, records that are being played. Uh, there are a number of allusions to uh, specific uh, singers and, and, and artists. Uh, we have an epigraph uh, as well. That is a, a musical uh, gospel nod. Um, and, you know, the blues were a, a really important subject for Baldwin on a number of levels. Um, uh, perhaps the short story that people are most likely to know by Baldwin is Sonny's Blues, right? Which is also a story really intimately connected to uh, the sort of many meanings of playing the blues. But what I think is interesting here is that Baldwin is sort of using this idea of Beale Street. Uh, and, and here I want to sort of shift to talk about what the title means uh, sort of alongside the question of music. Uh, Baldwin is, is using this title uh, referring to this street in Memphis, you know, Beale Street, uh, as a sort of nod, first of all, to the very tradition of the blues, because Beale Street is famous in musical history as a place where the blues flourished. You know, so many, so many of the legends who are known as, uh, you know, you know, singers and players of, of the blues played at Beale Street. But there's also a deeper resonance to me in, in the title, If Beale Street Could Talk. So wh why would Baldwin choose a title like this? It's, it's, it's oddly phrased. The grammar is a little interesting. It's not even New York, even though it's a New York novel. What is going on here? I've always liked to think about this idea of a street in Memphis that at core is similar in some way to many other streets 
uh, in Baldwin's America. In other words, there's something about this street that even though it's geographically distant is quite similar to the streets that Fani and Tish are walking down. There's a sort of core experience of what it means to live in these streets that Baldwin is trying to capture. But it's also a book, you know, that sort of focuses on the moments, both big and small, that happen in those streets. And so I love thinking of this idea of streets telling us the stories that they see. In other words, if streets could really talk, what would they tell us? They would see a lot more than we do, right? And what incredible and scary stories they would have to tell us. So if Beale Street could talk, what stories would it tell us? And I think that's what this novel is in some ways. It's the record, and I mean that in two senses of the word, of the streets. It is quite literally this capturing of these two characters who in some ways are, you know, unremarkable. I mean, Fanny and Tish are just very normal characters. It's this capturing of their lives and it's telling us what it's like to be them, but it's also connecting their struggles to the larger experience of both Blackness and anti-Blackness uh, across American history. So Beale Street in Memphis doesn't have to be that different at core from Bleecker Street in New York, because if you're Black and you walk down the road and the wrong person decides to get in your way, the same interaction might occur. Officer Bell, you know, the white officer who tries to imprison Fawny, he's in, he's in Memphis too. He's all across the United States. There are Officer Bells all across American history and, American, and America's present. Officer Bell put his knee, I would argue, on George Floyd's neck last year. A very similar officer tried to take control of the life of a Black man. Because at core, that's what the street is recording, right? You know, the beautiful moments, but also the horrifying moments when lives are snuffed out or when somebody tries to take control of a Black life. So I think this is quite literally a novel that tries to show why Black lives quite literally matter, you know, capturing the mundane and the magical alike, but also capturing the malicious, you know, the ways that white officers like Officer Bell uh, try to wield their power on these streets in, in very malicious ways. Uh, so I know that sort of got, went off, off yeah. uh, tangent a little, but I, I think that's sort of how the music and the title and everything is sort of interconnected, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes total sense. And the blues, of course, being a form which blends joy and rage and sorrow. Yes, in, yes, in of way, course, of course. Yes, yes. The, yeah, same as, as you were saying. Well, you know, there, as you were saying, there's also an epigraph, which is a, a musical illusion, you know, Mary, what you're going to name that pretty little baby, which of course is, you know, goes to the theme of babies and miracles and possibility. Um, but, but also the part titles to this book are interesting. Um, the, that's in two parts. Part one is called um, Troubled About My Soul, which is, you know, a, go a gospel illusion, you know, Lord, and Lord, I'm troubled, troubled all about my soul. Uh, but as soon as my feet strike Zion, I won't be troubled no more. And the end of the book is called Zion, yeah. which is quite interesting. And because also, you know, name in, no name in the street is a similar structure. It, it has two parts called, you know, take me to the river to be baptized. And then you, you read that book and you wonder, well, what kind of conversion is going on here? And so I guess the question is similar here in this novel. We're reaching Zion at the end, but what does that mean? I mean, in terms of the plot, as you said, every avenue they pursue to try to get Fani out of prison actually fails. I don't want to give a spoiler. You know, the, you know, the, you know, you know uh, 
Danny's testimony can't be turned around. The Puerto Rican woman, you know, is, you know, whatever. And, and yet, you know, so, but, and yet still the end of the book is called Zion. So some, there's some, something has been born or settled. And what's interesting is that each of the characters has some kind of change in that last section. Um, you know, Fani's father has a change. Tish has a change. Um, Fani himself undergoes a change in prison. And so I guess I'm just wondering how, how do you understand that structure of Lord, I'm troubled to Zion? Is that ironic? Is it, is it, is it Baldwin saying, you know, is it, <laughs> is it bitter, you know, <laughs> because, because there is no Zion or is there some kind of movement, something being born there, even if it's not obvious in the external plot with these characters? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, you know, quite literally, uh, you know, something being born, uh, you know, between these two sections, uh, you know, you know, the most obvious of which is that Tish has her baby, right, which is, you know, the, the theme we've been turning around for, for the entire book, uh, the fact that Tish is pregnant, and her and the father is in prison. When we get to the end of the book, uh, uh, that, that that section called Zion, uh, we don't know, and spoilers are being given, I'm very sorry, uh, we, we don't know of absolute certainty, you know, where Tish's life is necessarily going. Uh, at, at, you know, at the end, uh, it seems like Fani is in a world of trouble. You know, there's there's trouble in the first section, but there's also uh, new trouble in the in the second section, which is that the Puerto Rican woman, as you alluded to, who had accused uh, uh, Fani, or more accurately, a, a a black man of assaulting her, she has disappeared. Uh, Daniel, who was Fani's witness, has been you know, you know, pushed away. He he's not likely to be a witness. And when Fanny's father, Frank, hears this, when he realizes that it seems impossible to see his son be freed, he commits suicide. It's one of the most heartbreaking moments uh, in in the book uh, for for me because it's not even that I you know, particularly loved Frank as a character, it's that I completely understood this sense of feeling like he couldn't do anything. This this almost impotent rage that he has where he feels that he wants to burn the system down, but he doesn't think he can. So he goes off somewhere and he fills his car with carbon monoxide and sits in it and kills himself. Ends his troubles. Ends his troubles. On the other hand, you know, we've been talking about, you know, the, 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 the negatives, the, the terrible things that are happening. You know, on the other hand, you know, the very last section arguably shows Fani possibly out of prison. It's it's I think it's a little unclear, but I think you can make a good argument that he's probably uh, uh, been let out on bail because they've acquired enough money to to pay bail. Tish's baby has been born. A, a new life has come into the world. But with that, there is the final sentence of the story, which beautifully and hauntingly mixes these threads that we've been talking about. So the final line of the book, uh, and, and I'm paraphrasing from memory, is that the baby uh, wails loud enough to wake the dead. Uh, it cries and cries and cries and cries. This is repeated a number of times, loud enough to wake the dead. So the dead, you know, that phrase is how we end this novel with a, even though it's a new life being brought into the world. So life and death are, are sort of fused together. 
in this finale. And it's very interesting because here we have an ending that Tish arguably has been hoping for the entire book. Fanny may be free, her baby may be born, but the, but the reference to the dead suggests that this baby is being born into a world where death is always going to be nearby. The possibility of death is always hauntingly close. This is a Black baby, and, it ha and very soon, Fanny and Tish will have to teach their child what that means. And unfortunately, that means that death is always a few steps behind, always a little bit closer than for somebody else. So I don't know. I mean, I've never fully come to a conclusion about why Baldwin uh, structured this book this way, but I've always sort of thought of this fusion of opposites, troubles, Zion, sort of being reflected in that final sentence where basically we're, we, are, we are told that the only way to exist in this world as, as a Black child is to acknowledge that these terrifying opposites, life and death, are always very close to each other. Trouble and bliss, these things are always very close, if that makes sense. It, it certainly makes a lot of sense, and I think it's a great summing up of, of, of the book in many ways. And, and I'm also afraid we have to leave it there, although that's a perfect place, I think, to leave it. Um, uh, and, um, you know, I think you know, Gabby and I would both urge you to read, to read this novel. There are, there are many strands in it that we haven't had a chance to unpack. I mean, Fani is an artist. Uh, yes, of course. And uh, there's, you know, um, Baldwin's reflecting on, on on that in the book too, which is a whole other area. But um, but uh, no, but Gabby, you really you really opened up the book for us today, and I thank you for that. Um, so you've been listening to Gabrielle Below discuss James Baldwin's novel *If Beale Street Could Talk*, published by Library of America, in James Baldwin's later novels, uh, edited by Daryl Pinckney. I hope you'll join us for forthcoming online events from Library of America. On March 18th, it's Women's Liberation, Feminist Writings That Inspired a Movement and Still Can, uh, a conversation with Alex Kate Schulman, Margot Jefferson, Barbara Smith, Jennifer Baumgartner, and moderated by Honor Moore. And they'll be discussing you know, what the Women's Liberation Movement was and what it means for us now. Details about this and other upcoming LOA live events can be found on our website, LOA.org, where you'll also find information about Library of America's James Baldwin edition and Women's Liberation Collection, and links to purchase those and other volumes of Great American Writing. You'll also find recordings of tonight's and previous LOA live events. Thank you so much to Gabby Below again, and thank you all for coming, and have a great evening. Thank you.